Hello and uh, welcome back. Um, now for our third session of today um, from uh, Dr. Helena Sykes from National Resources Wales. We'll learn about the operational use of remote sensing. Thanks, Helena. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And can everyone hear me and can people see my screen? Lovely. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's really great to talk to all of you here today and those of you picking it up later on the recording. I'm going to give a bit of background today on NRW and talk about two of the things that have had a massive impact on our remote sensing work this year and then move on to talk about two of our longer term national project projects that we're also um, working on and as I go through you're definitely going to be able to see some really obvious links back to some of the things that we've already heard about um, today. So who are NRW? Um, a lot of people don't know this or don't know the, the full picture of this, so it's always worth sort of going over this with a new audience. We were formed back in 2013 from the Countryside Council for Wales, which was a separate organisation for Wales that's the equivalent to Natural England, from the Welsh part of the Environment Agency, the Welsh part of the Forestry Commission and some functions of Welsh Government, such as marine licensing. Uh, and we later, a couple of years after that, took in the internal drainage boards in Wales as well. So our remit is massive and we are the largest Welsh Government sponsored body with around 1900 staff uh, plus contractors at the moment. So we've got a huge range of roles and responsibilities. We're an advisor to Welsh Government, the public and charities. We regulate uh, marine, forest, uh, industry, waste. We designate national nature reserves, national parks, uh, sites of special scientific interest, so triple SIs. We are a Category 1 responder under the Civil Contingencies Act, and we respond to around 9,000 environmental incidents a year. We're consulted on about 9,000 planning applications per year, and we manage about 7% of um, Wales's land area, um, among other things. So already I'm sure there are examples jumping out to all of you of where remote sensing um, could and should be used. And environment is a devolved area of legislation in Wales, um, which is quite nice. All our work is underpinned by the principles of the Sustainable Management of Natural Resources, um, SMNR, which is an integrated way of managing the natural resources based on the idea that if we've got a healthy and resilient, resilient environment with ecosystems whose intrinsic value is recognised in their own right, it will improve the social, cultural, environmental and economic well-being of Wales and its people. And this is underpinned by two key pieces of legislation. The Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act 2015, which requires that all decisions by public bodies in Wales are only made after considering the impact on future generations. And we are the first country in the world to have that in legislation. Other countries sort of visit Wales to learn about that. So, so that's that's nice working in the environment in, in Wales. And the Environment Wales Act 2016, which requires public bodies to maintain and enhance biodiversity and the Welsh Government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see where um, remote sensing ticks a lot of boxes for both of these um, areas. I'm not going to show the video um, today, but I left this slide in just so that you've got the link when the slides are shared. It's a nice little video. It's two minutes with some funky music uh, showing NRW stuff out and about uh, around Wales and showing off the environment. So it's impossible to talk about our work at the moment without talking about the impact of COVID. And there were huge changes overnight in the early days of the pandemic to how NRW could work in terms of site visits, inspections, field work, and even responding to environmental incidents. And this is just the routine day-to-day -day work for many people in NRW who are out and about um, every day. And I was being contacted every day by people who either hadn't done remote sensing before or hadn't done very much remote sensing before who were having to completely overhaul the way that they were doing their jobs. Uh, and also people who just found themselves with some spare time at their desk for the first time in years and wanted to learn a new skill. And uh, my job um, as the lead specialist advisor in remote sensing uh, covers helping all of those people across the entire remit of NRW as best as I can with data, software, training, and advice. Um, but I'm going to focus in on one area of that for the first part of the presentation, which is sort of waste crime um, and enforcement. But across the board, if anybody wants to get into remote sensing, as we've heard earlier, there are decisions to be made about what the best type of remote sensing is for the application and the, the size of study area uh, that you want to look at. And as you go down the screen from satellites to aerial photography, 
and LiDAR and drones, you're getting increasing resolution. So you can see smaller things on the ground. You can see things in more detail, which is great. And you might think that you're automatically going to want the best detail, but you're not. Because as you go down the screen, you've got increasing data storage requirements and computational power needed to process the same area, which comes with increasing cost in terms of both time and money. So as you go back up the screen, it would be for an increasing size of study area. I normally start at the top when I'm doing webinars, but it makes more sense today to start at the bottom and talk about drones. Um, there's been some quite exciting work done on drones um, in NRW over the last few years. We've got several drones in-house and qualified uh, Civil Aviation Authority licensed pilots. Um, even though we are a government agency and not a profit making business, our pilots are still required to be licensed with permission for commercial operations because they are doing their drone work as part of their paid employment. So that would apply to any of yourselves in your organisations um, if that applied to your staff. Um, we also do contract out some drone work, so we need to have the skills in-house to be an intelligent customer for that. Um, things with more specialist sensors, for example, are things that we just don't have the capacity to do. But crucially, we also work with partners such as emergency services um, during incidents using their drones uh, where they may already have 24 hour cover in a certain area, which is, is really good. We're in um, memorandums of understanding with those emergency services, we've got four police forces in Wales and uh, three fire and rescue services who, who are crucial in those local resilience forums. And while we're on this slide, just have a look at the picture in the top left, which is Oxwich Bay on the South Gower, because we're gonna see that at different scales, gradually zooming out as we go through the presentation. So our fanciest and most expensive drone was purchased through proceeds of crime funding, which is money that's been recovered from criminals, the profits of their crimes, and is given out to people like public bodies to do work against those kind of crimes. Uh, and that level of funding is available quarterly if we wanted to apply for any more drone equipment, for example, and um, that drone is used primarily for investigating um, illegal waste sites. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Uh, as well as investigating the sites at the time that the crime is taking place, uh, the drone is useful for investigating how far proceeds of crime money that's been used to clean up the sites has gone and how much more um, money would be required to finish cleaning up sites in terms of disposing properly of certain um, areas and volumes of waste. So it's kind of proceeds of crime funding um, paying for itself. Um, and we'd be happy to discuss that if um, anybody from other organisations wants to get in touch. But as we move up the screen, we know that sometimes drones are not the right answer. Um, it depends on the size of the study area um, greatly because with the Civil Aviation Authority restrictions on drone flying, you do need to be able to keep the drone in your line of sight. Um, unless you've got sort of special additional permissions for that. So that does limit the size of area that you can study with a drone. You might not have a drone in the right place um, at the right time. The weather conditions might not be quite right. And you also need landowner permission for the site where you're gonna take off and land the drone from. Um, which for us, where we manage 7% of Wales, actually we're, <laughs> we're in quite a good um, position there. But what do you do um, with looking at waste sites if a drone is not the answer? And the answer is going up to satellite data. Um, I'm briefly going to show you Sentinel Hub, which is a really nice website because this has been an easy hit for getting the most people in NRW up and running with remote sensing uh, in the shortest space of time when they're not necessarily from a remote sensing background. And this is a great website. It's a free web viewer from the European Space Agency. Um, this is Sentinel-2 data that we've heard about earlier, loaded in for Swansea, where I am based. Um, you choose your place name over here on the top right and your um, satellites, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Landsat, etc., right over here on the right hand side. And here with this calendar, you can look at what dates imagery available for for your area. I've set a 20% cloud threshold here. Um, of how much cloud I would put up with for my imagery. And you can see that there's an image that met the criteria for that uh, yesterday. So we're literally looking at Swansea yesterday here um, on Sentinel Hub, the 21st.
And down the left hand side, you've got all these different band combinations that we've heard about earlier. You can change this to um, view vegetation and to highlight different things. So different people working in different functions of NRW would have different priorities for this. Um, there's also a fairly basic classification on here and a lot of stuff does show up quite clearly um, at this scale. However, this is the free data from Sentinel-1 and 2, which is at best at 10 meter resolution. So that is not going to work for everybody. But what's been added to Sentinel Hub this year, um, the timing of this has been absolutely incredible, is commercial data from Planet and Airbus's Pleiades and Spot satellites at much higher resolution. We heard from Mark about Planet at three meter resolution, but we do actually have access to data as good as 50 centimeter resolution from um, Pleiades through the paid account of Sentinel Hub. And you can see that getting access to paid accounts on Sentinel Hub is not prohibitively expensive. Um, a number of us in NRW have got this level of access, um, which gives you sort of a dashboard where you can um, order packages of commercial imagery through. And it also has the advantage that the visualizations that we've seen of the Sentinel-2 data and also Sentinel-1, as well as the actual imagery itself, can be a direct feed into your own GIS systems um, as a service. And this has been a fantastic service that we're very keen on in NRW. We found it incredibly useful during the flooding in February, which I'm going to talk about later being able to bring that Sentinel data into um, the same environment as all the rest of your corporate data that you hold and any new data that you're, you're adding at the time. Um, there is a free 30 day trial available of these paid accounts and I would strongly recommend that if anybody's at all interested, give this a go, um, especially because it's not the same kind of free trial where you have to enter card details and it will charge you if you forget to cancel it. It's not, you don't enter any payment details and all that happens if you get to the end of your 30 days um, is that you go back to just having the, the features of the free account, which is the one that we've just seen um, on the screen. And similarly to what we've seen earlier from Mark, I just wanted to show you the difference between the Sentinel data and the three meter planet data. Um, this is Oxwich Bay on the South Gower again, and the background image is the Sentinel-2 data. And you can see that once you've zoomed down to that scale, variation within individual fields, individual sites is getting much more difficult to pick out. Um, but if you look at the three meter planet data that's laid over the top of that, you can see that there's much greater detail um, and at that scale, that's going to be significantly more useful imagery. Um, in the past, we've been used to commercial data being beyond what we can afford in a public sector organisation. Um, you had to buy full satellite scenes of larger areas and pay for them, even if you only wanted smaller areas, which was just not something that we realistically could do um, ourselves. But you can see how reasonable the, the package is um, from Planet. It's 155 euros for 100 kilometer squares of data. And crucially, you can order it in 0.01 kilometer square chunks. So you could just look at the same site over and over and over again. And as we've heard, you could be getting data daily um, if it's cloud free. Um, Mark mentioned the planet trial in Wales. So this is probably a good time to talk about that as well. Uh, NRW is part of that along with Welsh government. Uh, so Welsh government's remote sensing staff, people in rural payments. Also, Welsh Water and Forest Research are all part of that trial, uh, proving use cases beneficial for us getting a longer term uh, contract for the three metre um, planet data. But uh, that only goes on until December this year, the trial. We've got five accounts in NRW and um, the data that we receive through that trial is on a quota. So if we wanted data beyond that quota or for anybody who's not one of those five people, we do need to go through an alternative platform such as this one. Um, the five people in NRW who are on the planet trial are two full-time remote sensing specialists, including myself. Uh, one person who does work in incident management, so uh, largely flood incident management. Uh, one person who's an officer in tackling waste crime and one person who works in landfill tax audits. Um, landfill tax being a devolved area of administration in Wales as well. And something I found really interesting that I found out this year and didn't already know is that illegal piles of waste can be taxed landfill tax if they've been left there for long enough um, as well. And also those court cases are civil, so they are on the balance of probabilities rather than criminal prosecutions, which are 
uh, have to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. So that is a really interesting use case for remote sensing data, um, seeing where those piles of waste are. Um, what we're finding this year is even good waste sites and good waste operators are struggling because due to the pandemic, um, the export markets for some materials of waste have completely collapsed and therefore waste is having to be stored in this country and it's not always necessarily being stored with adequate um, surfacing and fire breaks. So that's something that we're looking to sort of rectify um, at this time. Um, and it became apparent during the pandemic quite early on that um, dodgy waste operators felt like they were not being watched um, because they weren't seeing people on the ground and how wrong they were. Um, I did see in the ENDS report that the Environment Agency in England had been asked for money back from sites that they were regulating because they felt that they weren't being regulated and it really showed how little some of those sites know about the remote monitoring um, capability. We could be looking at sites in 50 centimetre resolution every day um, if we wanted to um, and I think it's good for them to know that. So quite early on in the pandemic, um, some comms was put out by NRW as a deterrent to waste sites. Um, you can see here in the bottom right. And also some of my colleagues have invented these letters to send to waste sites, showing them um, the state of their waste site. And this could be literally the day before. Um, this is what your waste site looked like yesterday. Here's some red text about what's wrong with it. Um, you know, contact us for advice about what it is that you're going to do. And this was inspired by similar letters from the ZVLA, which is also based here in Swansea, um, using uh, pictures of people's own cars, showing them their own untaxed car with their, with their registration plate clearly visible and sort of showing that they're watching, um, which I think has been um, quite a good move. And this is something that's been shared with um, other regulatory agencies through a partnership that I'm going to talk about um, a bit later on. The other really big thing that happened this year that sort of disrupted all the work that we were doing and forced us to do things a bit differently was the flooding in February with Storms Kira and Dennis. Um, there were places in Wales that had the highest river levels since the 1970s uh, and places in Wales that had the highest river levels ever during this incident. So that was absolutely huge. But there were also places in Wales where when the rivers reached those levels in the 70s, thousands of properties flooded, whereas this time they did not, which meant that um, clearly what's been done since then to put in defences and change land management, for example, has been working. But unfortunately, there were areas that were still very heavily impacted by this, the flooding and the unprecedented river levels um, in February. Um, this is Monmouth. Uh, this is the road bridge in Monmouth on Tuesday, the 18th of February, when the, the River Wye in Monmouth peaked. Um, and we're going to look at some satellite imagery of that um, in a minute. One thing that we considered doing during this flooding, which would have been huge, and I'm glad we didn't have to, would have been to invoke the International Charter on Space and Major Disasters and the Copernicus Emergency Management Services. Um, both of these services would have to be invoked through the UK Space Agency and the Cabinet Office and the UK invokes them on average about once every 18 months um, and it is a huge deal and you would have to sort of write a quite formal report afterwards on what you did with the data um, and how it was used. The way, the, the way these two services work, the, the charter, um, the disaster charter, you can request um, satellite data from commercial companies that wouldn't normally be free and for data that would normally be free if those satellites weren't due to come over your disaster area for several more days you can have the space agencies that own those satellites task them to come over sooner so that you get that data and can work on it and this is a, a multilateral agreement um, you know, we might get data from, say, a Japanese or Korean space agency, but it would work the same way if they were having a disaster. European satellites would immediately be tasked to, to point at the, them and try and help out. The difference between these two services is with the disaster charter, you get access to the full archive of data so that you can look at your disaster area before the disaster as well as during it. But you can only use the data during the response phase, not in the recovery and risk assessment phase. And what you get is the raw data and you have to process it yourself. And this could be sort of huge reams of data that you need to go through depending on what you request in the end. The Copernicus Emergency Management Service uh, can be used for recovery and risk assessment as well. But what you and what you get is a map, say a flood outline, 
um, instead of getting the raw data. But in terms of data, you only get the data that went into the map rather than the full archive, which you don't get to choose. It might take a little bit longer to get the map than it would if you were getting the, the data uh, through the charter. And the big one is we do not know what will happen to this service after the end of the Brexit transition period. We do not know if we, the UK, will still have access uh, to this and negotiations are um, ongoing. I was advised at the time by the UK Space Agency that if I was going to invoke this, um, I should invoke both and see what happens. And it did at one point look like we were going to have to do that. Uh, back on Sentinel Hub, the Sentinel-1 radar data um, is useful during flooding because the longer wavelengths of the radar penetrate clouds and allow you to see what's happening on the ground where the Sentinel-2 data can't because the view is obscured um, by the clouds. The visualizations of the Sentinel-1 data on Sentinel Hub are really good. Uh, this advanced enhanced visualization that they do shows wet areas in blue, which does show flooding quite nicely. And I'll show a more zoomed in version of this in a minute. But when I looked at this over Skype with our specialists in flood risk analysis, because this was at 20 meter resolution, they, it just wasn't quite good enough to show on the ground um, exactly what they wanted. So at that point, it did look like we were going to have to go ahead and invoke the charter uh, during the week of that flooding. However, the thing that saved us from having to do that was this service, um, which was mentioned earlier. It's Aberystwyth University's EO Data Down service, which delivers the analysis ready data that you heard about earlier to government in Wales. It's Aberystwyth University service, but contracted from Welsh government, but using methods that were developed at Aberystwyth University by those academics in the first place. So that's all, you know, joined up quite nicely. And as well as us getting the analysis ready Sentinel 2 data for um, not just, you know, during incidents, but for all our longer term projects, it delivers analysis ready Sentinel 1 data, but at 10 metre resolution, um, not the 20 metre resolution that, um, that we see on Sentinel Hub. And Pete Bunting at Aberystwyth University did a great job with this. He really pulled out all the stops during the flooding. He put the 10 metre data on an FTP site for us so that we could pull it straight off. And when I showed it to my colleagues in flood risk analysis, they thought it was great and it was good enough for everything that they needed to see on the ground. And it saved us from having to um, invoke the charter, although it's always good to know that the charter is there. So I'm just going to show you another set of slides. I separated them out because the full resolution version of this on my um, other computer is really quite large and I didn't want to um, crash the system. So looking in at these areas of the flooding, um, here's the River Usk coming up from Newport. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. And here's the River Wye going up from Chepstow. They both come out in the Severn Estuary. This bottom right hand corner, you're just seeing a little bit of Bristol here. So just to get a bit of context on where we are. And the top left of the image is the mountains of the Brecon Beacons National Park. Uh, where we'll see in a minute that a lot of rain accumulated before that flooding, just because we did have storms, Kira and Dennis, uh, back to back in February, which really was unfortunate. And these two red squares are just areas that we focused in on for the flooding. These are the areas that we chose as a sample for the disaster charter training, um, as if we were invoking it, where we would have requested higher resolution radar data um, to see what was happening on the ground. So going before the flooding on the 7th of February, um, just reminding people that blue is wet in the in this imagery. If you are a remote sensor interested in in how this imagery was made, which is the same as the visualization on Sentinel Hub, um, it's to do with the different polarizations of the the radar from the Sentinel One imagery. The pulse can be transmitted or received vertically and horizontally. So the three bands of this image are the red is vertical vertical the uh, green is vertical horizontal and the blue is VV over um, VH. Um, if you don't understand what that means, it doesn't matter. Just stick with the whole um, blue is wet thing. And as we step through time here, you can see things are getting wetter on the 8th, the 10th, the 11th. Oh dear, we know we're heading for trouble um, at this point. There's no sort of getting out of that. That water has to go somewhere. And unfortunately, on the 16th, it went there. 
and you can see um, all of this flooding along the River Usk, so going up here through Ab Abergavenny and Crick Cowell and really starting to flood on the River Wye um, above Monmouth. Um, and on the 17th, you can see that that flooding has moved downstream there, uh, and the same thing happened on the Wye. Uh, you can also see some flooding further upstream here um, on the English side of the border um, on the 17th. Um, we don't have a Sentinel-1 image for the 18th, unfortunately. Um, you heard earlier about how at the equator you get imagery every every six days. Uh, at these higher latitudes, you do get it every every two or three days. And unfortunately, the 18th was one of the days where Sentinel-1 did not happen to come over and we didn't get that. But um, the 18th was the day of, of the photograph that you saw of Monmouth. Uh, and here things are on the 19th when things have settled back down down a bit and all the water sort of moved back out um towards the the um the seven estuary um one of the other things i'm going to show you is how we use satellite imagery and, and drones together during that flood um i work in a monitoring team with a lot of monitoring people and i'm aware that sort of across a multitude of different organizations monitoring people feel that we remote sensing people are trying to replace them um i don't believe that i i think that the remote sensing side should be used to target the ground monitoring more smartly and in some cases it, it the ground monitoring is drones which are still remote sensing um that here is a very nice 360 degree view of the flooding taken by my very talented colleague Luke Maggs, an NRW drone pilot using an NRW drone in Crick Cowell on the 20th. And we can use this evidence to deploy drones um, or on the ground monitoring of various types to different locations as we see fit um, based on the evidence from remote sensing. And this is just an example from the flooding. Um, I am now on the steering group for the flood review, which I've not been involved in before, just because the role of remote sensing this year is much greater because of the impact of the pandemic on people's ability to do field work. So you can see how all that's sort of been a perfect storm uh, and uh, come together this year. Um, I should add that um, Luke and his colleague Nick have made some very other very nice 360 degree views like this of our natural national nature reserves, which can be found on the um, NRW website. It's not all sort of doom and gloom um, on the drone side. So we've been very grateful to Aberystwyth University for the analysis ready data service that they've provided, and we do use it for a whole lot of other stuff. Um, as we've heard in earlier presentations, anything at this sort of catchment scale, you do by default want to be looking at the free data from the Sentinel satellites, especially because we are lucky enough to have the analysis ready data version of it here. It's only once you start zooming in from here back down to Oxwich here, say that you need to start looking at data that you would need to pay for or be part of a contract where somebody else is is paying for it for you. So moving up a scale again, I'm going to finish off by talking about a couple of national projects. Um, this isn't one of our images. This is one of JNCC's. I'm sure many of you will recognize it is a Sentinel-2 best pixel mosaic from uh, June 2018. So I just wanted to show you this, how good the Sentinel-2 imagery is at a national scale. And I work in a job that covers the whole of Wales and look after um, a lot of national indicators as well. And we heard earlier about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales. Um, the Wellbeing of Wales is measured by a series of national indicators, one of which is Indicator 43, the extent of semi-natural habitat in Wales. And one of the key data sets that went into working this out was the analysis ready Sentinel-2 data of Wales at two different times of year. Um, the way this indicator works is that we've got um, We've already got an existing phase one habitat map of the whole of Wales, so showing different habitat categories at approximately field scale. So that was reclassified into places that were definitely semi-natural at the time they were surveyed, definitely improved at the time they were surveyed, or a category that was possibly improved, which would rule them out as being semi-natural. Uh, and the satellite data was used to rule out additional areas um, as being semi-natural. Um, we've heard about the Normalised Difference Vegetation Index earlier, which shows vegetation productivity and is usually displayed in red. 
uh, we compared spring and summer Sentinel-2 imagery and the vegetation indices from that. And with places that are showing as highly productive in the spring, those places are productive because they have been artificially fertilised, usually by farmers, which rules out them being semi-natural, so excludes those areas. So it's really crucial to have those two different time periods of imagery for the same area to make that comparison across the year. Other data sets that went into this were also agricultural subsidy data from Welsh Government, um, places that have been declared as improved fields or reseeded um, any time since I think 2003 were also excluded as uh, being semi-natural habitats. And we also needed to put in a term for how productivity could be expected to be naturally, which uses the elevation, the slope, the aspect and the distance north, because uh, from south to north in Wales, the growing season does vary by a couple of weeks, um, all of the things being equal. And at the end of all of this, we found that Wales is 31% semi-natural, 74% um, in the uplands, which is coming down as far as the upper limit of enclosure, but only 19% in the lowlands. So that is kind of the pattern that we would expect. And we would obviously like to see those numbers increase um, the next time we do this indicator, which will probably be done every five years. And I'd just like to add special thanks to Richard Alexander from Natural England um, for his contribution to this work. We heard earlier about Natural England's Living Maps work and he shared the Living Maps code that they developed with my predecessor, which in turn evolved into some of the code for Indicator 43. And that's a good example of collaboration that's come about because of the DEFRA Earth Observation Centre of Excellence that we've also heard about today. Another thing I'd like to talk about is the national LIDAR coverage of Wales. I think a lot of people on the line would be very familiar with um, the Environment Agency's Geomatics Group and the national LIDAR coverage that they're flying of England. And we, of course, lost being part of the Environment Agency when we separated off into Natural Resources Wales in 2013. So we lost Geomatics Group um, as well. But we would also like national LIDAR coverage um, of Wales. And this is something that uh, Richard Lucas from Living Wales uh, who we've heard about also pushed for and this is something that has been funded by the Welsh Government with us working closely with them on the procurement and the specification. Um, the national LIDAR coverage that's being flown of Wales will be a new baseline data set, a consistent data set at one metre resolution. Um, the existing LIDAR data that we've got at the moment is a variety of resolutions and time periods. It's going to be flown leaf off, so over the winter, uh, and it'll be flown over the next two winters, although we did already get a thousand square kilometres um, earlier this year before there were too many leaves on the trees. All the data will be open, including the point clouds, and there will be pulse classification according to the Environment Agency schema, so that we've got a consistent data set along our border with England, and we can stitch it together with their data for our shared catchments and both get the most accurate possible flood modelling. There are a few challenges with this. Um, resource is always a challenge. Um, the collaboration that we have with or other organisations such as JNCC is a massive help with that and the culture of, of sharing uh, code and methods and knowledge. Um, costs are a challenge but the cost of commercial imagery for example is coming down massively particularly with new ways of it being delivered um ict is a challenge i am an ict nightmare because every time they give me more um uh, computer processing power or data storage i tell them that i need even more and i'm never going to go away um and there's a few legal issues um with the commercial data, obviously it is commercial data, it can't be freely shared in the way that the Sentinel data can. It's supplied under terms and conditions, which can make things a bit complicated. Um, for example, you might see a set of terms that says you can license data to your own contractors, which would be your own lawyers if you're prosecuting somebody, but not the other side's lawyers who are not your contractors, but you might still be you know, legally required to share it with by one set of, of laws. So things do start to get complicated there. And additional issues for drones. One is you're flying it yourself, um, unlike the other the other sensors that are involved here. And two is of our remote sensing data, it is the only data that's zoomed in far enough for individual people to be identifiable, which means that you're also subject to um, GDPR. But there's a webinar coming up which will answer a lot of questions about the legalities of drone um, drone data and drone flying, which will hopefully um, cover. Um, some of the useful areas as well. 
It's from the five agencies, SHARE, um, Shared Agencies Regulatory Evidence Programme. SHARE is made up of the environment, env environmental regulators of the four administrations of the UK plus the Republic of Ireland. Um, they've put this webinar on. It has already been postponed once because of COVID and the new provisional date that I've heard is the 15th of October. Uh, and there's a registration link here in the slides. So hopefully that webinar would be useful to some of you and it follows on from the excellent drone conference that we had in Wrexham uh, at the start of last year. So thank you very much. Uh, I've just put a few links in here at the end about how to access NRW data and uh, geospatial data for Wales more widely. Uh, the proper channel to come to us for procurement to try and sell anything to us is this website coming to me directly um, is not going to work. You will have to go through the proper channels. And here are some contact details for NRW. You can contact us in English or Welsh. And here are some links to our social media channels. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Helen Hel Helena. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that was fascinating. Um, I'm just waiting to see if there's any uh, questions coming in for that broad range of topics that you've covered. Um, lots of practical advice and uh, use on actually using the data in the field for a range of uh, uh, policy areas. So thank you very much for that. Great, thank um, you. I've put my email address on the front slide as well if people want to get in touch afterwards. Great, thank you. So any questions? You've got uh, a, a few seconds to uh, put them in the questions chat before we move on to the next session. Okay, so none are coming in at the moment, um, but if, they, if something occurs to you during the next session that you'd like Helena to answer, are you around till the end, Helena? Yes, I'll be here. In case anything comes up, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. for the uh, next session, um, we're going to, is this the final session of the day? We've got a practical scenarios quiz. This is going to be led by Guara Jones. Guara, over to you. Yes, and it is supposed to be a bit of fun, so don't take it too seriously, I guess, is my advice. Um, but just to check if you were listening today uh, and uh, whether you, you do actually have the tools to be able to make decisions on what sorts of remote sensing would be best for particular scenarios. I've come up with four scenarios, um, but uh, I, I've come across uh, in my time at JNCC and I've been asked this question. Um, so I'm going to run them via polls. So um, I'll put the first poll up and then talk you through. So hopefully you will all have a question now, or well, a requirement if you like, not a question. Um, so the first one is monitoring condition of semi-natural grasslands that are under grazing pressures at national scale. Um, so you've got four options. Now we've given you a spatial resolution option, um, spectral resolution option, what platform that is on, and the temporal frequency. So those are the, the, the things that are uh, most uh, um, important for you to consider. So to give you an example, um, high spatial resolution, multispectral satellite, medium frequency is what I would probably call Sentinel-2, which is a lot of the examples you saw in Paula's uh, presentation um, earlier. Um, uh, low spatial, multispectral satellite, high frequency, uh, the one kilometer squared pixels, MODIS data that I mentioned in my talk. Um, and then the, the bottom one, very high special res resolution, multispectral aerial low frequency. So that's um, so similar to what I would call aer aerial photography. So um, I'm not saying that one answer is correct. Um, I would say that some of those um, scenarios are probably more suitable than others. Uh, so don't be afraid to uh, pick one. I don't. I can't see who chooses what. So um, um, it'll be interesting to see what the uh, the collective group um, think is the right sort of scenario and the right sort of Earth observation to try and answer this question. So I'll just give you uh, um, five minutes to have a think about it. And as soon as uh, um, most of you have voted, I'll close the poll and we'll have a discussion about the results. Okay, so we're at 75% voted. I'm now going to close this first poll. Um, we jumped up to 80%. Um, so I am now going to close this poll and share the results with everybody.
Um, so the answer, the, the, the scenario that came on top is high spatial multispectral satellite at medium frequency, um, which tells me that you have been listening today. And I think that is definitely one of the top scenarios uh, to be able to help uh, you pr uh, find information and evidence uh, under this particular requirement. Um, high spatial radar satellite and medium frequency, something like Sentinel-1 would also be very useful. So those of you that have selected that, um, you're not wrong. It's definitely something that sh should be considered, um, especially if you're having a particularly cloudy year and um, the, the multispectral satellite isn't giving you the data that you need at the right time of year. Low spatial multispectral satellite, um, depending on the size of your fields, um, you might have a chance in doing this. If you're doing this at a global scale, then this, the low spatial resolution uh, satellite data would definitely be the way to go because um, unfortunately one of the drawbacks of high spatial resolution is you get really noisy data and lots of data like that can give you really conflicting results at a global scale. So the, the lower um, spectral, uh, spatial resolution does help does help with that. Um, very high spatial, multispectral aerial, but low frequency. Um, so I would say this is probably the least likely um, to be helpful in this in this case. You could probably use aerial photography to help you map the semi-natural areas in the first place. Um, so similar to how, how Helena was using the phase one map in the indicator 43 example, but aerial photography just isn't frequent enough to help you um, understand how grazing changes throughout the year, which is what you would probably need um, to help you uh, understand what's going on in your fields and understand the pressure. So you need within year data as opposed to, I think aerial photography in the UK is updated once complete coverage once every three years or so. Um, so I think you all get a um, hypothetical clap for, for getting the right answers um, mostly. Um, so I'm now going to give you uh, another poll. So the second requirement is detecting trees that have been illegally felled or have fallen due to wind blow. Um, now, we have already talked about this um, throughout the session this afternoon. It was a question earlier, um, so you should be able to, from those answers that were given, um, be able to make a decision on which of these satellite scenarios, uh, EOS scenarios, Earth observation, sorry, scenarios would give the best answer. So I'll give you another five minutes to uh, answer that question. Okay, so I'm now going to close this poll and we'll see what the results are. So this is quite interesting because um, th there's no clear winner here uh, as to which scenario would be the most useful for um, helping with this particular problem. Um, and I would say that's probably representative of, uh, of the problem itself because prim all of these scenarios could probably help in some way or another with answering this problem. Um, so I said at the beginning, there is no correct answer, just a probability of the scenarios being able to help more than others. Um, so let's go through them. The one that came out top, a uh, very high spatial multispectral satellite medium frequency. So this would be similar to Planet or uh, which Mark talked about. Um, uh, and yes, I think that would definitely be useful um, with illegally felled trees. Uh, probably not so useful with wind blow because you're talking individual trees here, so it might struggle to pick out individual trees in the multispectral data. Uh, this is where the radar data is probably going to have um, a much better chance of, of picking up that, that sort of uh, event within trees. Um, and also radar data isn't affected by cloud. So it is interesting that those two came out on top and that the high spatial multispectral satellite medium frequency, so the Sentinel-2s of this world came out bottom um, because I would say the Sentinel-2 is probably pretty good um, if you know 
uh, an area that has been felled, it would probably be your go-to uh, place to try and narrow down the window um, of when that illegal felling happened. Probably using tools like Sentinel Hub, which Helena showed, that's probably one of the easiest ways to access that information. Uh, very high spatial multispectral aerial at low frequency. Um, so again, talking about um, ca capturing uh, data from planes or helicopters, which I know um, Forestry Commission have used in the past to try and uh, get a feel for uh, the uh, phytophthora, the diseases, etc. I would say again, that's probably the least helpful here because it's uh, not very timely, so it's very difficult to organise that sort of survey. Um, so yeah, interesting results, everybody. Um, so moving on to the next uh, scenario, there's there's two more, um, but the next one should be quite fun as well. It's all about penguins. So um, the requirement is we need to count the number of penguins in the col colony. And Paula did talk about this earlier. So um, if you remember that, you're doing well. <laughs> I'll give you uh, five minutes to, to answer. Okay, so I will close this poll so that, to give us enough chance to do the last one. Uh, Paula, do you want to? do a synthesis of the results for this one since you showed a slide on this specifically <laughs> yeah so well, i think that's actually um I'm, I'm quite pleased with the results that looks like people really were paying attention so i'm very really, very happy um yes yeah, so it's obviously um a strong preference for multispectral drone imagery even though i did show a couple of examples of um, how you can see species in satellite data um but with penguins if you wanted to actually count the birds yes you would need a drone you would need that high spatial resolution as in the natural england example of counting um gulls um you could use very high spatial multispectral satellite imagery as 39 percent of people said to infer the number of penguins. So in the example I gave from British Antarctic Surv um, Survey, you could use that type of data, but you wouldn't be actually counting the penguins. So they're both very good answers. Um, yeah, is that, that's okay. Is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, so just to add that low frequency is probably okay here, because we know when the penguins are going to be where. Um, so you know the time time of year that you're going to have the be best chance of getting to count the colonies. That's do, usually during their breeding seasons uh, uh, when they come to shore to do so. Um, so you probably don't need a, a high temporal resolution um, unless you know you're trying to get an image over Antarctica and a uh, cloud is a problem. So that's the only other thing I would add there, I think. So moving on to the last one of the day, I, I'm hoping I'm hoping these are useful for you guys to to put yourself uh, your brains into work after listening all afternoon. Uh, so the last requirement is um, kelp mapping around UK waters. So I'll just give you uh, about three minutes to to get your answers in. Okay, so I'm now going to close this poll and share the results. Uh, Paula, offering again for you to synthesize the results if you want to. Yes. Um, so we've got um, high spatial multispectral satellite at medium frequency with a strong preference for that one. Um, I think for kelp, um, it would be a good idea to have high spectral resolution because distinguishing kelp from say fucoid algae uh, and even from any any other kind of um, seaweeds or even seagrass could be very difficult. So I would say the high spectral resolution is very important. Um, and I probably, I would go for high spatial resolution um, because although kelp forests um, can be very, very extensive, um, depending on the sort of the seabed substrate, you could get little patches. So it depends how, um, you know, what kind of fine detail you wanted to capture. I guess if you were looking at it as a sort of a habitat you know, biodiversity um, perspective, and you really want to know like about little patches and their connectivity and things like that. And um, whereas if you were more looking at it as um, say, providing ecosystem services and just, you know, in say, terms of carbon storage or pr protection from storm surge, you might want a more broad scale um, map. And so uh, it's a lower spatial resolution could work for that.
So um, yeah, I think the bottom two uh, would be good answers. Um, I'm not sure about radar. Um, <laughs> you can use you can use lidar um, to map kelp. Um, uh, just to, to talk about different sensors for a while, um, you can use um, the bathymetric lidar that has a red and a green laser pulse and kind of therefore goes bounces off the top of the sea surface and goes the other one goes through the water and bounces off the bottom and that can detect kelp. So there are other sensors you can use, but I'd go for those bottom answers and agree with those people. To be fair, we haven't really discussed radar below the water level um, and there's not a lot that can be done below, below the water level is the answer um, <laughs> but we haven't really um, touched on that today so brilliant I think um, that that's the end of the polls uh, today and hopefully you found those useful um, and I'm now going to hand over to Lynn to close the session. Thanks Gwar, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, just before I close, I just wanted to remind you of a couple of upcoming events that have been mentioned by several people um, throughout the course of the day. So just a few um, uh, elements here. So we've got a water quality monitoring workshop uh, on the 13th and 14th of October. And uh, this will also include some training data uh, some training sessions, sorry. We've also got a course of four uh, two-hour sessions on um, learning how to use radar data, which will focus on uh, SAR, and it's uh, suitable for beginners. And we've also got the webinar on Thursday this week, looking at um, using uh, APIs to access the analysis-ready data through EODS and CEDA, and including um, the GitHub platform and the community forum. Uh, etc. So those are those are upcoming. Um, there should be some links in the chat coming up. If you're interested in any of those, you can uh, click on those links and find out more about them. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, just all we, all we have to do now is uh, say thank you to all our uh, fantastic speakers. That's been a really excellent and fascinating afternoon. I hope you've all found it as useful as I have. So thank you to Gua Jones and Paula Lightfoot from JNCC, Mark Richardson from Planet and Helena Sykes from NRW. Thank you all for attending today and also for listening again if you're on the using the YouTube video later on. And please do fill in our feedback form. There was a, a link in the chat. This helps us to improve uh, sessions in the future, obviously. Thanks to the organisers at JNCC, and uh, we'll let you know when the recordings are available and the P PDF of the slides also, uh, because if you're like me, uh, I won't have retained all of the things and it'll be useful to, to look back at some of the detail uh, at our leisure. So now I'm going to bring this webinar to a close. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>